Hello and welcome, RC Shim in the hangar. Today I, not today, this week rather, because it's a bit complicated. This week I played around a lot with the Spectrum. You might recall my review, which is it's a few months ago, that I reviewed the Spectrum V6. A USB high power spectrum analyzer. This is the Hyperlock antenna to it. And I decided to examine very closely what the GPS Crossfire Micro module does. If it's just sitting there alone and then if it's connected to the receiver of a copter, which is here. I have my laptop set up with dual USB power, so it can get really a load of, of signals <laughs> into it. And on the bigger screen, I see it in details. That's probably what you know from a RF spectrometer. That's the thing that we know, but we have waterfalls and pulsed 3D waterfalls as well. That really will help me show you things better, just in 3D. So yeah, I understand it's very tech heavy video. Uh, use the index below <laughs> to skip the boring parts. I hope there are not too many boring parts. But I already, uh, this is the thing that you need to do a lot of practice until you can make a video because yeah, the video will be very boring. So I already saw a lot of very interesting stuff, at least for me. Uh, and I really love to visualize what we just read somewhere or what we have to believe. Uh, it's almost better if you have facts and if you can measure something. And that's exactly what this device is so great for. I've tested everything about TBS now already, uh, at least what I can test here. And I will also test the, this radio here more because it is an internal module which is a multi-mode module uh, that can emulate a lot of different RF languages like Futaba, Hitech, Hitech, FreeSky, FlySky, whatnot, Spectrum. So in theory you can uh, control all your different models with just one radio, which is great. So let's dive into this. Okay, let's take a look at GPS Crossfire micro module. I have a 20 dB attenuator on my antenna, so I don't hear too much surrounding noise, only the noise directly or the, the RF signals directly in front of the antenna. Firstly, I will turn off the clear right because it's a bit disturbing. The yellow one is the average and red is the maximum value, which you can reset here and you see it goes up and this is about where the noise level of my peaks is. So now when I turn on the radio, which is a TX16S, Welcome to HTX. you see there's not a lot going on at 2.4, but there is a, a sweep from 2.4 to 2.5 roughly uh, when I turn it on and it doesn't do this if I don't have the TPS Crossfire micro module in the module bay of the radio. So this is from the TPS module. I didn't know, actually I didn't know that it is. The micro module also has a 2.4 GHz thing inside, but it's maybe for updates. But of course we see, even in the 25 millibat mode that the, the module is in now, we see 850 to 876. Now we can zoom into this region and do a waterfall diagram or even a pulsed 3D waterfall diagram to look very close at what I'm seeing here. So here we are examining a TBS signal. In the normal spectrum view, it just jumps around in the predefined range of 860. 873. It's a bit narrower if I go to 868CE and reset. Now it's between 
862 and 868. That's what CE mode allows. But let's go back to the normal 868 mode uh, so I can show you things better. So that's the spectral view. Uh, it's good, it's very accurate and you can zoom in uh, very far, very close. But to visualize this better, I firstly go into the waterfall diagram, which I have at a thousand uh, time compression level. And then I pause this and try to find the repeatable pattern so I can sync it up for the synced for the pulsed waterfall later. By taking a look at this picture, you see that the repeatable pattern is from here to here. Start at the bottom of this, go to the bottom of this one here. Uh, conveniently, it also states that this is roughly one hertz. So that we know this value, we can go to the pulsed waterfall and enter this duration field here. I set it to exactly one second, thousand milliseconds. And if it's good, I mean, sometimes it flickers, but if it's really uh, the interval, the correct interval, then those lines don't move. For example, if I take 980, so it only scrolls down a bit. So now you see it scrolls up rather because the interval is moving. You get the point. So set it to 1000 exactly. Then this should stay nicely in place. And if it stays in place, we can examine this quite good. And we also see one thing, the width of this pulse. And it's a bit hard to measure. I mean, you can see it here on the line on the bottom. But it's a bit hard to measure in 3D. You just get a good graphical idea of it. Once again, in the waterfall diagram. And now I see the signals better. From the start of such a signal to the start of the next one. So we are in the 50 hertz mode. And this correlates to these rather fat lines here. Right now I don't have the copter turned on, so it's not connected to the receiver. So this is in the listen mode. It, it searches for a receiver. And now let's take a look what happens if I connect the copter. You see much more spikes here. So these smaller spikes, they get bigger, by the way, if I move the copter nearer or closer to the antenna. And they get smaller if I move it away. So these are the telemetry packets that come back. And I'm still in the 50 Hz mode. So one thing that I learned is as soon as I enter the Crossfire Lua script on the radio, it shows us much more spikes because it's already in the 150 hertz mode and telemetry mode. So if I go to the Nano RX now, Lua script, and change to 150 megahertz, telemetry on, and go all the way out, we now see a lot more spikes and more importantly, those spikes have gotten thinner because they are in 150 hertz mode. Let me look really close. Start here until the next. Yeah, this is, this is really close to 150 hertz. If I set the telemetry to off in the radio, you see the small spikes disappear now. It takes some time, but now we don't have telemetry. Funny thing is, you will see as soon as I open the Crossfire script now, telemetry comes back because it needs the telemetry to set up the functions on the receiver. I could change to 50 Hertz, go out of it, wait a few seconds, telemetry spikes go away, and our main spikes are now wider or thicker because they are in 50 hertz mode. And now I change the 
frequency to 868 CE. And back again. Still in the 150, but it will be in 50 megahertz mode soon. Now it is. Now it's in 50 hertz mode and it's quite narrow because we're in the CE band. And if you ask yourself whether to pack the telemetry spikes now, if we enable telemetry again, let me quickly. Okay, so I do have telemetry now. I see it on my radio. But there's no spikes in this region, it really sticks to the allowed region. So they have to cram in more signals. You see the telemetry spikes are neighboring the fat spikes. But telemetry is always in 150 hertz mode, it's, it looks like, or like smaller pulses. Yeah, it's nicely to be seen here in 3D. And they are smaller because I have the copter further away. Ah, that's really impressive to, to be seen here in 3D. I like how it can help me visualize this for you. In a normal waterfall, you see this is the main spike and this is the telemetry spike. What I also found out in the race modes, the interval is not one second, but two seconds. This will be a rather simple test when I have the TX16S here in free sky mode. My test model setup, the antenna right next to it. And here I have just an D4R2 FreeSky receiver, which I bound to this. FreeSky is at 2.4 GHz, we know this. In a wider view I can examine if it does something out of the band, but it doesn't. So I will just concentrate on the 2.4. But you see, its frequency hopping is from 2.4 to 2.4.70. I would be looking for a repeatable pattern as well. And I think I found it. Okay, let's say this is the first package. And this one is the last one. 1693. 1693. I mean, it looks better this way with the noise floor at the floor, at the ground. But you can, of course, also move it down to only see the spikes themselves. I think the telemetry are those spikes here. So that's free sky. Have you ever seen free sky that close? Ah, it still looks better with the with the solid ground, with the green ground here. <laughs> that's frequency hopping with the nine 0.06 megahertz. Now we can examine these really close. And you, you start to see one, two, three, four. I, I would count 14 values here with different lengths. Here we have 115 hertz, 109 hertz. 110 Hertz is the update rate of FreeSky here. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> this is FreeSky L9R, supposedly a long range receiver on 2.4 GHz. How did they try to achieve long range? Yeah, we will see shortly. Uh, it's the same 70 MHz of bandwidth frequency hopping from the beginning of a packet to the next packet we have. 54 Hertz. So it's a reduced rate for long range. This is okay. Their frequency hopping distance is around 16 megahertz. So they are further apart. I already measured their duration, their pulse to be 846 milliseconds until it repeats. And then you get this view. So 50 Hertz and farther frequency hopping hops supposedly makes it easier for the receiver to distinguish signals when the signal strength is very low on your long range flights. So that's what we tried here. And I will see no difference. Yeah, I'm connected already. 
but if I turn it off now, no, none of the spikes will go away because there are no telemetry spikes here that we could see. So no telemetry on this radio protocol, but supposedly longer range. I turn on my really old, but trust the T T10 turbo, 2.4 gigahertz and 35 megahertz in the 2.4 gigahertz mode. No receiver bound yet. Of course, the frequency hopping is not synced up under the thousand milliseconds. And sometimes, if it's so nice of a of a pulse. Auto detect could work. Let's just hit auto detect. Yeah, 252. That's also what I measured in the waterfall in the manual mode, like 252.2 milliseconds. You get a very easy and good idea of how frequency hopping works. So it transmits a bit there, then moves the frequency and so forth. So it's just an incremental frequency hopping, not a an, an random based one. I guess we should measure from here to there. And see we are in 150 or 47 hertz here as well. It's a 4.2 megahertz frequency hopping. But it has more jumps. So that's what Fodaba Advanced Spread Spectrum Technology. That's well, quite old. That's what Futaba did back in the days. Okay, thanks a lot for watching this very in-depth video. I'm sure a few guys are curious about these kinds of things, at least I am. And I really love to use the Spectrum V6 for these kinds of very accurate measurements. Yeah, the new software is, is phenomenal, by the way. Uh, I didn't use the Spectrum for a few weeks or months now and checked back on their website and saw that there is a new version 2.0 and I installed it. And I, in the changelog I, I've seen their changing of stuff very rapidly. So there's a lot of development going on, which is really nice. And also they have like a forum where you can get support. So yeah. It's really a nice, very high quality product and it lets you measure stuff very, very accurately. If you have some recommendations or a curiosity for a detailed measurement, just let me know in the comments. I see if I have the necessary stuff. For example, I would have loved to compare the Beta FPV ELRS Express LRS to the crossfire, it should look the same, but yeah, a connector broke there. So I need to get replacements for this, then I can check this out for you. Until then, thanks a lot for watching. See you in the next video quite soon. The next video will be about the TX16S, which I really like a lot. Thanks a lot for watching. See you next time. Bye for now.